The war in Gaza is at a bit of an inflection point right now, while peace talks are ongoing around the possibility of a relatively long-term ceasefire. We're also seeing a lot of indications that the war could escalate in the north with Hezbollah and that Israel is preparing for the next phase of their ground operation in Gaza, pushing into the southern city of Rafah. It's a lot to get into, so let's get started. Beginning with the possibility of a Rafa operation, something that people have been worried about and talking about for some time now, Defense Minister Gallant this past week was touring portions of northern Gaza, saying that the military is readying its actions in Rafa and areas of the central part of the Strip where the IDF has not yet operated on the ground. He said, quote, We are closing in on Hamas. We are preparing to act in Rafa, as well in the central camps, in order to reach the next stage, which we will decide according to our priorities. He said, quote, we will use the information we captured from the Hamas archives. There are huge amounts of information that we brought from the places we reached, computers, hard drives, servers, and other things. All this information is decoded. It is used in order to destroy the tunnels and the nerve centers of Hamas. This is a piece that I think is overlooked a lot throughout the course of this operation, but in any military operation, as they move through and they kill low-level fighters, they might be able to gather intelligence for the next target. And any time they move into a relative command center, even if it's a squad, platoon, or company size element, if you will, rather than the overall Hamas headquarters, they're able to gather, Israel in this case, is able to uh, collect and gather intelligence that they, they can then use to target further Hamas operatives across the Strip. So as they continue to move through Gaza, they're gathering more and more of an intelligence picture of where their next target should be and where some of these high-value targets should be. Gallant says that the Hamas tunnel network is little by little turning into a trap for the Hamas militants. He says the result is very clear. Hamas are getting weaker with each passing day, and we are getting stronger. We will go and tighten the rope around the neck of Hamas until we eliminate it. He says the war in Gaza will not end until Hamas is dismantled and that Israel will only make concessions for the release of the hostages that the terror group still holds. Not drastically different than what we're hearing from most Israeli officials at this point. They're still drawing that pretty hard line in the sand that no matter what a ceasefire or an end to hostilities looks like, it will absolutely mean the return of all hostages to Israel and the dismantlement of Hamas as a governing structure in Gaza with no military capabilities. Then we've got a troubling report that came out of the Euromed Human Rights Monitor organization earlier today, where they said that Israeli tanks have deliberately run over dozens of Palestinian civilians alive. And this part gets a little graphic, so be ready. They said that they've been able to document the Israeli army's killing of a Palestinian man who was deliberately run over in Gaza City's Al Zaytun neighborhood on 29 February after he was arrested. They say the man was subjected to harsh interrogations by members of the Israeli army who bound his hands with plastic zip ties before running him over with a military vehicle from the bottom to the top of his body. They say the incident occurred on the main Saladin Street in the Zatayun neighborhood, according to eyewitnesses who spoke to the Euromed Monitor team. They say that Israeli soldiers restrained the victim's hands before they crushed him and trampled on the body from the legs up, confirming that he was alive throughout the incident. They said to guarantee thorough and complete crushing, the team of uh, the victim was placed on asphalt rather than an adjacent sandy area. There were pictures released of this, and it's graphic. I would not suggest seeking that out to look them up. The group also demanded that an independent expert on extrajudicial summary or arbitrary executions visit the Gaza Strip as soon as possible to look into these alleged illegal killings. Then a foreign policy article yesterday said that war has become inevitable with Hezbollah. They said it's time to stop the wishful thinking and start looking at the facts. In the article, they say the Israelis are determined to capture and or kill the Hamas leadership and render the group incapable of being an organized threat to the state of Israel. If the IDF threatens to turn these goals into a reality, the Iranians are ready to lift whatever constraints under which Nasrallah's forces have been operating rather than accept Hamas's defeat. That day seems to be approaching. And this is an interesting aspect here because one of the considerations early as to why Hezbollah did not immediately push into Israel was Hamas had yet to be tested. You know, it took a few weeks for Israel to move into the Gaza Strip. There were a lot of airstrikes into Gaza, but it wasn't anywhere near clear at that point that Hamas would not continue to function as an entity. As they say in this article, that day is becoming increasingly more likely as Israel moves further and further through the Gaza Strip which means that it's possible that Iran, Hezbollah, and some of Hamas's allies might feel it necessary to step in to prevent Hamas from being entirely defeated. 
They say the Biden administration has been consistent about two issues during the Gaza war. First, Hamas must be defeated. Second, a war between Israel and Hezbollah must be avoided. And that continues to be a focus of the Biden administration. They say as time goes on, diplomacy has proved to be fruitless. And if the Israelis claim victory in Gaza, they will turn their attention to fixing the security problem in the north. They say it is an existential issue for the Israelis because despite the wishes of the White House, war is likely to come to Lebanon this spring or summer. It's not an issue. The fighting there has been continuous. It ramped up, certainly, uh, starting on October 8th, the day after the Hamas attack into Israel. But that has not been a peaceful border in a long, long time. It is a persistent security threat to Israel. So it's not crazy that there's people inside of Israel saying at some point when the capabilities are freed up, when the attention is freed up, we have to do something on the northern front. And that's what they're getting at here. They say the Israelis need to replenish their stocks of certain weapons. When it comes to taking on Hezbollah, the IDF needs more precision guided weapons, which would be critical to neutralizing Hezbollah launch sites at other sensitive locations. The Israelis cannot acquire these weapons without the supplemental aid package that now languishes on Capitol Hill, meaning that the major military operations that Gallant envisions to push Hezbollah away from the Israel border cannot happen, not yet. So that is the mess that we've got here in the United States where border security Israel and Ukraine aid were all bundled together, and in turn, none of those actually made it through. It does look like they'll all be addressed at some point, and the Israel aid is one that I would say at this point has the least objections and is the most likely to come through in the short term. They say, but Congress will eventually act, and once that happens, the last restraint on the Israelis will be gone. Presumably, the IDF's major military operations in the Gaza Strip will have wound down by then, allowing the force to turn its full attention to the north and to Hezbollah. They say, so either Nasrallah will order his forces north to the Latani River, or the IDF will force them back. Hezbollah will resist because what better way to burnish its tattered domestic credentials, and it is unlikely that there is any way to hold off war now. We've been talking about this for quite a while. There's so many different indications pointing towards the possibility of a war between Israel and Hezbollah. And as every day comes and goes, it looks more and more like this is an inevitability, as foreign policy puts forward. Now, there's some other reports related to the possibility of war in the north. Supposedly, Iran sent a message to Hezbollah to prepare for an all-out war against Israel that will open soon. In a new report, they say the commander of the Iranian Quds Force recently met with Nasrallah in Lebanon. It was reported that Tehran gave the organization the green light to prepare for a large-scale attack on Israel to the extent that the IDF maneuvers into Lebanon. So that piece there suggests that Hezbollah will not kick off anything offensively, but will be prepared to act in a defensive capacity. They say the order was given due to the fear in Tehran that the IDF will soon invade Rafah and then carry out a ground maneuver in Lebanon. They say, quote, Nasrallah said that it is certain that an Israeli attack in Lebanon will be carried out soon, and he asked the Quds Force in advance for complete freedom of action against it, end quote. It's according to an Iranian source that was quoted in this report. Again, this lines up with a lot of other organizations, their predictions about what is coming in this war outside of Israel, outside of Lebanon, outside of Iran. There's a lot of people looking at this saying, man, everything is moving towards a war, and that's, that's not a good thing. Then turning to the unofficial U.S. stance of this whole situation, a senior U.S. official talking with CNN said that the Biden administration is operating in the assumption that a ground operation would occur into southern Lebanon sometime in the next couple months. They said they don't expect an operation to be imminent in the next few weeks, but perhaps later this spring, adding that an Israeli military operation is a distinct possibility. Then looking at the Hezbollah reaction to all of this, one of their senior politicians, Hassan Fadlallah, said, quote, The war in the South is linked to the aggression on Gaza on the one hand and to securing means of protection for our country on the other. It's a mixed bag for Hezbollah. It's not all about Hamas, but that plays a significant role. It's also about what Hezbollah views as securing the southern portion of their country. He says, quote, When the Israeli occupation halts its aggression on Gaza, this front stops because it is a supportive front. They said that if a ceasefire were to take place between Hamas and Israel, that Hezbollah would abide by it so long as Israel did not continue to attack Hezbollah forces in southern Lebanon. That seems to be one way at this point. Uh, Defense Minister Gallant earlier this week said that Israel planned to increase attacks on Hezbollah in the event of a possible ceasefire in Gaza. Then there was some news last night suggesting that this ground offensive into southern Lebanon might have kicked off, but I'm a little bit hesitant with the information we have so far. So Hezbollah put out a couple different announcements, but 
in total, they said that Israeli forces penetrated into southern Lebanese territory and were stopped by Hezbollah forces, direct fire, indirect fire, as well as some IEDs. I haven't seen anything from Israel related to this quite yet. Uh, if anything, it sounds like it was a small raiding party rather than the start of a major operation. Either way, it's notable that that was reported at all. It's something we'll have to keep an eye on. Then turning down to the Houthis in Yemen, where their leader, al-Houthi, gave a speech this past week, he said, quote, no matter how extravagant they commit crimes, the Zionist Jews are inevitably doomed to extinction, defeat, and disappointment. He said, enemy raids and bombing did not affect our country's military capabilities, and the correct position that contributes to the stability of the entire region is to stop the aggression and end the siege of Gaza. So again, this is a point that the Houthis are hammering home every time they get the chance, every time they announce that they carried out a strike, whether or not it was successful or not, they always tie it back to Gaza. They say they are doing this, they're attacking ships in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, military and civilian ships, because of what is happening in Gaza. Now, one of those ships that was struck on February 18th was the MV Rubimar. It was a Belize-flagged, UK-owned bulk carrier, which on March 2nd was announced that it had sunk. The Rubimar was carrying approximately 21,000 metric tons of ammonium phosphate sulfate fertilizer, which is now just, just gone, just out there in the ocean, which I'm sure is great. Um, this is the first, my understanding, the first ship that has so far been sunk by the Houthis since they began carrying out these attacks in the region. Then a couple days ago, U.S. Central Command and the Royal Jordanian Air Force conducted a combined humanitarian assistance drop into the Gaza Strip, they say to provide essential relief to civilians affected by the ongoing conflict. The United States says that their C-130s dropped over 38,000 meals along the coastline of Gaza, allowing for civilian access to critical aid. In a statement from U.S. Central Command, they say we're conducting planning for potential follow-on airborne aid delivery missions. These airdrops are part of a sustained effort to get more aid into Gaza, including by expanding the flow of aid through land corridors and routes. Now, it wasn't all positive. There was some pushback, uh, a lot of criticism about the U.S. dropping this aid into Gaza. Largely, the criticism was that it's a drop in a bucket. It's not doing nearly enough. There was one take here from Scott Paul, uh, who leads an organization called Oxfam. He said, quote, while Palestinians in Gaza have been pushed to the absolute brink, dropping a paltry, symbolic amount of aid into Gaza with no plan for its safe distribution would not help and would be deeply degrading to Palestinians. It does, however, sound like aid is continuing to find ways in, whether it's on the ground or in the air. There's multiple countries trying to find ways to get more to the Palestinian civilians as this war rages on. It came up in a speech given by U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris this past weekend, where she said, quote, given the immediate scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire for at least the next six weeks, which is what is currently on the table. This will get the hostages out and get a significant amount of aid in. She said, people are starving. The conditions are inhumane and our common humanity compels us to act. She said, the Israeli government must do more to significantly increase the flow of aid. No excuses. And in wrapping up, she said, Hamas needs to agree to that deal. Let's get a ceasefire. Let's reunite the hostages with their families, and let's provide immediate relief to the people in Gaza. Now, this was notable because there's been a lot of talk from the U.S. government about how they, they would prefer a ceasefire, and they want the hostages to return, and Hamas to no longer be in power. This, from what I've seen, is, is the senior most U.S. official outright calling for an immediate ceasefire during the ongoing hostilities. Now, the ceasefire is far from guaranteed at this point. As I'm recording this, the morning of March 4th, there's a lot of mixed information about what has been agreed upon and what is still up for debate. A U.S. official, unnamed, said that Israel has more or less accepted the deal that's on the table, but Israeli media said that Hamas is refusing to confirm which of its hostages are still alive, which Israel is threatening to not participate in these talks any further. They have moved to Israel. The delegates are in, in or I'm sorry, in Egypt. The delegates have moved to Egypt, but they might not attend the talks if Hamas does not present a list of who's actually alive. Now, I saw some interesting takes on this the other day, people criticizing Israel saying, how on earth are they just now asking for a list of the hostages? It, they're not asking for a list of the hostages. They're asking for a list of the hostages that are still alive. And it's not entirely clear how many of those are. Every day, just this past week, Hamas put out information that seven more of the hostages had been killed. So that is a piece of information when you're going into these negotiations that is critical to have you know relevant data up to the hour. So from, from my take, it's a very reasonable ask for Israel to say, 
who is still alive as of right now, who is still alive as we negotiate these, these hostage releases. And it doesn't seem like Hamas is willing or able at this point to provide that information. Now, the conditions that Hamas continues to stake out is that a permanent ceasefire w is permanent, first off, not six weeks, and that it will allow for the withdrawal of all Israeli troops from the Gaza Strip. So we mentioned earlier in the video the statements from Israeli government officials talking about how the complete and total dismantlement of Hamas is what will come before any ceasefire. But here we have Hamas kind of sticking with their side of a permanent ceasefire and all Israeli troops leave. It's, there's quite a bit of daylight between those two. And then lastly, this past week, over 200 lawmakers from 12 different countries signed onto a letter committing to persuade their governments to impose an arms embargo on Israel over what they say is Israel's grave violation of international law in its ongoing war against Hamas in Gaza. The grouping of countries here include the United Kingdom, France, Belgium, Canada, Brazil, Spain, Turkey, Ireland, as well as a few others. The only person from the United States that signed on to this was Democratic Representative Rashida Tlaib. Uh, and she said, quote, we cannot wait. Following the interim ruling by the International Court of Justice on the genocide convention case against the state of Israel, an arms embargo has moved beyond a moral necessity to become a legal requirement. Now, it's not clear entirely what the mechanism would be that they would push this forward. The, the argument here, or what they're saying, is that they will try to persuade their governments to get together to impose some sort of arms embargo on Israel. Israel, of course, not happy about this information coming out, but I think it has a long ways to go before it is in any way, shape, or form adopted by the broader international community. But that's all I've got for now. Of course, if you're interested in this or other national security subjects, be sure to check out our Substack, linked in the description below. Substack is kind of a mix of a website and newsletter. We've also got audio recordings of the articles that we're publishing. So if reading isn't your thing, but you still want the information about you know, China's little blue men, their maritime militias in the South China Sea, or how France is losing their grip in the Sahel, which is seeding the path for Russia to take over more influence in the region. We've got that audio and written word, if interested. Of course, we'd love for you to check it out. Link in the description below. But thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.